supernova. You never fail to completely inconvenience exhibitors in the strangest ways. Welcome to my convention review series. Today we're talking about Gold Coast Supernova 2022. This is my first time exhibiting at a supernova outside Melbourne and I was really excited to finally get to a Queensland show. I've heard multiple times that the majority of Australian Love Life fans are in Queensland and have wanted to do an anime con up there for years. I'd heard bits and pieces about Gold Nova specifically and was able to confirm a lot of things during my weekend there that I'll cover throughout the video. As usual, the application process for Supernova is very straightforward, so I won't be covering that, but I do need to touch on one repeat error from Melbnova. I mentioned in my Melbnova 2022 review that Moshtix only sent half my allocated tickets via email. The Supernova website still states that tickets are not sent out prior to the event, so this time I contacted both involved parties. Supernova responded first, stating that I should bring it to Moshtix's attention and fix any remaining issues at bump in. Moshtix responded next, asking for feedback on the support I received. I did not receive any support. To this day, Moshtix hasn't responded about the issue and I doubt I'll actually hear back from them at all. I suspect this issue arises if you add an additional table to your booking after submitting it, rather than choosing two tables when applying. I did this at both Melbourne and Goldnova events this year and will be able to confirm if this is the issue when I apply for Sidnova. Stay tuned for more on that one. Needless to say, the ticket issue was fixed at the door by staff outside the exhibitors hall. But before we get there, I want to talk about the venue. Goldnova is held at the Gold Coast Convention and Exhibition Centre in Broadbeach. It's located near a shopping centre, plenty of restaurants and cafes, and the tram line. There's a tram stop for the convention center, which makes traveling to it very easy if you're near the line. For those unfamiliar, the Gold Coast tram travels in a mostly straight line from Helens Vale to Broadbeach South. The convention center is on the Broadbeach North stop, second from the end. The stop is directly outside the convention center and trams run pretty frequently, so if you're looking to get accommodation for Gold Nova, I'd recommend sticking to places near the tram line. The convention centre is a pretty nice venue. It's entirely indoors and the lobby is air conditioned. I'm sure the panel rooms would be as well, but I didn't go in any. What I do know, however, is that the hall the vendors hall was put in is not. The vendors were placed in Hall 4, a large room with auditorium style seats at one end. This means super tall roofs, but the room is entirely enclosed, so there's no windows or natural airflow. The temperature jump between the lobby and vendors hall was noticeable during bump in on Friday, so you can imagine how bad it was with hundreds of attendees in it. It wasn't anywhere near as bad as Melbourne over this year, and I was able to wear my mask for most of the event, so I'm grateful for that at least. I was pretty excited to see that the floor plan puts all exhibitors in the same room, much like my beloved Melbourne Nova 2021, and had heard it's always been a small alley compared to other Supernova events. I completely underestimated how small the alley would actually be. I'm mostly sure Goldnova is the smallest Supernova event and I'd been told multiple times that the artist alley was compact. I'm not sure why this is, but I can only assume exhibitors prefer Brisnova or Sidnova. I don't think it's a space issue because there was plenty of space in the vendors hall and I will be talking about that later. When we arrived on Friday, we had our check-in info and vaccination certificates checked by venue security. I want to stress this. The people that checked our phones before we entered were Gold Coast Convention and Exhibition Centre employees. We had the same information checked again when we picked up our exhibitor passes at the door to the exhibitors hall and had to read an information sheet before entering. The sheet covered safety information like wearing high vis and I wish I could talk more about what was on that sheet but I was in such a rush to fix the ticket issue that I did skim it. We had to sign a sheet to say that we'd read it before we were allowed to enter. I honestly can't remember if the staff at the door were hired by Supernova or the convention centre. There's a massive issue that makes me think they were convention centre employees, which I'll get to, but they had no idea what I was talking about when I brought up the Mosh Ticks issue. I showed them the passes I received and that I was supposed to get more, and it was kind of surprising that they didn't mention anything about it. Mitch of Melbourneova complained about it, which made me think they would have shared this with the relevant people, but apparently not. Like I said, I'll be digging into this more at Sidnova. Inside the hall, the map was split into three groups. 
licensed vendors, artist alley, and celebrity signings. We were right next to the signings area, which made me think we were in a pretty good spot, but that wasn't exactly the case. When we got to our spot, we found that most of the booths in our row were missing their tables. We didn't have the half wall between our tables like at Melbnova, which was a bonus, but we were missing the most important pieces of furniture. Two of my friends went to speak to the attendees at the front because they were the only staff members we'd seen until that point, while I went looking for exhibitor services. By the time I'd organized myself, my friends returned and said there should be a phone number for Expronet in the exhibitors pack and to call them. This is what makes me think the people at the door belong to the convention center. I called Exponet and spoke to their representative, who seemed pretty miffed when I explained who I was and what I needed. He explained that Exponet only delivers tables to the venue, they don't actually set them up, and that he couldn't actually help me. So I found Exhibitor Services. The volunteers there explained that Exponet hadn't delivered all the tables and that they were expecting the remainder the next morning. They said they'd and I quote, steal the tables from someone else because not everyone will show up today. By the time I got back to the table, my mates had already done that, taking the tables from the end of our row. But the volunteer that came with me said those tables belonged to another business and that we couldn't have them. We had to put them back. This will be relevant later. So the volunteer grabbed us tables from somewhere and we were able to set up without issue. Before we left, I noted that there were toilets near us on the map but when I went looking, all I found was a giant storage room and a bunch of smoke doors. Smoke doors aren't supposed to be left open, at least according to the signs on them, and that will become important later. We assumed the bathrooms were beyond the storage room and decided to work it out Saturday. When we arrived Saturday, the attendee line was already from the exhibitors hall entry to the convention center entry. This is a fair distance and it was good to see so many people there off the bat. We had our check-in and VAC certificates checked at the main entry, but not the entry to the exhibitors hall. The vendors next to us still hadn't shown up and we arrived reasonably close to 10am. They never actually showed up and at some point during the day, their tables were removed. The tables we apparently weren't allowed to use weren't used at all, leaving a two booth gap between us and the end of the aisle. This became an issue as more attendees came in, but I'll get to that. As with all supernovas, traffic was decent in the morning and picked up after lunch, then slowly dropped off until the end of the day. Lines to the celebrity signatures picked up very quickly and became a massive attendee sponge. One of the biggest guests for the weekend was Tamura Morrison of Star Wars fame, and there were hundreds of people lined up to meet him. Being so close to the signing areas meant we were able to see all the booths and most of the line for the entire weekend. Well, we thought we could see most of the line, but we're not up to that yet. As I mentioned, traffic was pretty standard, and I started to think that our location actually wasn't that great. Most people heading to the signing area seemed to go down the leftmost aisle, and since we were at the furthest end of our aisle, I get the feeling a lot of attendees skipped our area. This is the Melbourne Showgrounds issue rearing its ugly head again. A certain area of the vendors hall is far away, and attendees will skip it if they don't recognize any of the names on the map. One of my table buddies mentioned that it's worth considering the created collectibles area at Sidnova and potentially other Supernova events for this exact reason. If you're not familiar with Supernova's map sections, the Artist Alley is broken up into five categories that exhibitors choose when applying. There's Creator Collectibles, Indie Press Zone, Prince Paradise, Fan Club Central, and Bites and Backlots. I very rarely see exhibitors in the last two, but let me explain them all very briefly. Creator Collectibles is for what you'd expect to see at an artist alley. Stickers, charms, handmade goods, artist design merchandise, etc. In a similar vein, Prince Paradise is for artists with only print-based media. Indie Press Zone is for creators with books, comics, graphic novels, etc. Fan Club Central is strictly for vendors based around specific fandoms, clubs, charities, and other organizations. Finally, Bites and Backlots is an indie zone for film and game developers. From what I've heard about Supernova's map layouts, 
Although Creator Collectibles is the most expensive area to book, the boon you get in prime locations can level that out. Specifically, Sidnova was used as an example here, as it's one of the biggest events and the indie press zone tends to be put at one of the far ends of the map. In the future, I would absolutely consider going Creator Collectibles, given the traffic and overall performance we experienced at Gold Nova this year. Since my first Supernova, we've always gone for the indie press zone because it's cheaper and location wasn't really an issue for us. But after this event, I'm absolutely considering changing that. When I walked around the hall, I noticed a severe jump in foot traffic around the licensed exhibitors. This is to be expected, but specifically the middle aisles of the artist alley seemed busier. Traffic severely thinned out towards the edges of the alley, where the large amounts of space left meant people would sit down, spread out their stuff, generally chat with their friends, and take up space. I had the same issue with the Melbnova Artist Alley, and while it wasn't as bad there, it was still awkward to walk around people who were lying down. I swear I saw some people napping, but I wasn't about to disturb them to find out. In general, sitting down in an otherwise high traffic area is a health hazard to both the people walking and those sitting. There was a seating area at the furthest end of the room with tables and chairs, and the one time I saw it, it seemed decently busy. The area behind us against this wall was a hot spot for attendees to sit in, as well as the area beyond the smoke doors. Turns out the bathrooms we were looking for were beyond the doors and through two rooms, a small connecting room and a larger lobby. The lobby was prime sitting and actually a decent spot for it, since the convention didn't have anything happening in there and it wasn't exactly a thoroughfare. Despite that, people still sat in front of the bathroom doors, which was a pain in the ass given how much other space there was, but I don't think convention staff went in there, so it wasn't regulated. I'm a stickler for the rules, so when I see OH&S violations, I do lose my mind a bit, which is why I harp on about groups of people sitting in foot traffic centric areas. Speaking of the smoke doors, though. All six sets of them were open on Saturday. I did note that they say not to leave open, but figured convention staff knew what they were doing. Turns out they likely didn't because they were closed the next day, leaving just one set of doors open to enter the bathrooms. As far as I know, this didn't cause any issues. Also kind of on this topic, when the tables beside us were removed, attendees started using the empty booth area to sit. This was a massive pain in the ass for us since we were dodging people when we tried to leave our booth and it was generally pretty banked up. At one stage, a few families, each with prams, used the space to stand and chat. They took up the space for about 20 minutes, possibly more. In the future, I wish Supernova would just leave the tables because at least then we would have a buffer between the back of our table and the general public. I don't care if people use those empty tables to organize their bags, at least they wouldn't be right beside us while we're trying to get merch out of our suitcases. Moving on, one of the things I have no idea how to address is the fact that the Australian Defence Force had an exhibitors booth. The ADF. The actual military. They had uniformed personnel running a VR game and I guess recruiting people? It was hard to tell exactly what they were doing and I sure as hell wasn't getting close enough to find out. As I was walking past, one of the store runners called out to a group behind us asking, do you guys want to jump on the VR? I'll be completely honest, I don't usually pay attention to the licensed exhibitors list so I had no idea they were going to be there until I was told and at the time I said I didn't know how to feel about them being there. One of my friends promptly told me I should feel very bad about them being there. I don't want to carry on about this too much, but there's a time and place for military recruitment and a pop culture convention is not one of them. I can't think of any reason they'd be running a booth that costs at least a thousand dollars other than trying to get people to sign up for the military. I can guarantee they weren't just there to let people jump on the VR. I'm going to double back and talk about the celebrity signature lines. As mentioned, the celebrity lineup for this event was pretty stacked, and I spoke to some volunteers that mentioned there were 300 to 400 people lined up to see Tamora Morrison on Saturday morning. That was at about 2pm Saturday, and the same volunteer mentioned that it was likely going to get worse that afternoon. 
I do have to give Supernova a massive amount of credit for their queue handling, since from where I was sitting, I couldn't see it for a majority of the time, and I don't believe it was a hindrance on the walkways. I did have one encounter with the line that I'll get to, but walkways were kept clear and lines were kept neat. I'd like to thank the staff and volunteers for handling the following situation incredibly well and professionally. Because Tamora's line was hundreds, probably nearer to thousands of people long, it was pretty clear he wasn't going to get through them all before the event closed. But he said he wasn't leaving until everyone in the line had a signature. I have to commend the guy, that is a massive undertaking and I can't imagine how badly his wrist must hurt after writing his signature thousands of times in a single day. I busted my wrist during 39 Mikus in two days. I couldn't imagine doing over 25 times that in a week, let alone a single day. But he absolutely followed through. And when the announcement went over that Supernova was closed for the day, hundreds of attendees stayed behind waiting in line. When we left, not long after 6pm, volunteers had congregated near our table and were moving metal fences to block off the ends of each aisle. Remaining attendees were under careful watch and kept in the area at the very left of the token booth, sneaking through to the table. The entire process was incredibly smooth and we left feeling confident that our stuff was safe. And it was! We returned on Sunday morning to find everything exactly as we'd left it. I heard from volunteers the next day that Tamora had been on location until 9pm, with the cleanup starting at about a quarter past nine. It's safe to say the line did get worse in the afternoon, but the absolute madman was back at it again on Sunday. Luckily when we left that night there were only 20 or so people in line, but throughout the day there would have been hundreds more lining up to see him. Volunteers and convention staff encouraged those in line to see and enjoy the convention while the line moved and to return later in the day. They knew everyone with a token would get a signature, but a lot of people clearly didn't listen to them because traffic was pretty slow on Sunday. I'd say it was standard, but at 3pm it was basically a ghost town. We think there was a panel running that a lot of people attended, but looking at the schedule I'm not sure which one that would be. Usually traffic remains strong during the cosplay events so I can safely cross that one off at least. There wasn't really a surge at the end of the day and despite our best efforts, I wasn't able to break even. There's quite a few factors on that and I did come incredibly close, but this leads me into the environmental factors surrounding Gold Nova this year. The Queensland and New South Wales floods are still ongoing and are a massive focus for regions across both states. Although a lot of areas have been deemed safe, there were evacuation orders issued in parts of New South Wales over the weekend. The focus on recovery has started, but ongoing rain and flooding has once again left entire communities cut off. This map shows reported incidents, roadworks, weather warnings and other hazards in real time. The entire eastern coast from Canberra up to Brisbane is an absolute mess of roadworks, planned roadworks and weather warnings. I don't think I need to explain this point any further, but I do want to encourage you to donate to Aiding Flood Relief if you can. I'd like to recommend donating to ARC, who have been out in the flood zone saving animals and reuniting them with their families. I'll leave a link in the description to their site and an excellent video by Friendly Geordies on the work ARC has been doing. Another big factor in Gold Nova's foot traffic was the fact that Comic Con Homegrown Brisbane had taken place two weeks earlier on the 26th and 27th of March. A lot of attendees talked about the event and the fact that they'd spent all their money there. There were a lot of attendees talking about money this weekend and while it's common to hear people talking about their finances, it was pretty prevalent at Gold Nova. This leads me to the final influence on Gold Nova sales, the general cost of living. Everything has become more expensive over the last few months and the massive jump in fuel costs are a fantastic example of that. Paying over $2 a litre for fuel is ludicrous and while the prices have dropped in recent weeks, other essentials haven't had the luxury of having their excise taxes cut. At Melbourne Nova earlier this year there was an air of excitement over events being back and people did spend a lot of money, but that seems to have cooled down now that a few more events have taken place. I imagine now that more events have been announced, attendees will start budgeting more and being a bit smarter with their money. 
Another massive impact on the fact that I didn't break even was the cost of flights. Flying on a Friday is expensive in general, but the flight from Tullamarine to Coolangatta cost over $200. Compare that to our flight home Sunday night that was a whopping $51. We also had issues getting accommodation, as Golden Over took place in the school holidays, so a lot of hotels in the area were already booked. We were lucky to find a really nice Airbnb for a decent price, but I do recommend that anyone exhibiting at an event that's taking place during school holidays get on their bookings as soon as possible. Keep those overheads low, because I would have broken even if our Friday flight was less than $200. I've mentioned the check-ins and vaccination certificate checks a few times throughout, but I'd like to go into more detail on Supernova's COVID policies. As always, an info pack was sent out with the policies outlined, but they were not enforced. Barely any attendees were wearing masks, and the only regulation on social distancing was done via announcements throughout the day. There were multiple announcements on both days about upcoming panels and events that also reminded people to socially distance and wash their hands regularly. Queensland's restrictions are stricter than Victoria's at the moment, but only when entering buildings. We had our VAC certificates checked at pretty much every building we entered over the weekend and weren't allowed indoors until we'd shown our check-in confirmation. Aside from that, masks were optional, Social distancing really didn't happen, and Supernova didn't once check that we had sanitizer on our table. This happened at Melbnova as well, despite the info pack stating that exhibitors have to have sanitizer. Despite being just shy of breaking even, I did enjoy Gold Nova and think it was a good taste of what Briz Nova will bring to the table. I'm keen to do more Queensland events in the future, and it was very interesting to see how Supernova handled big name guests. I've never seen a line like Tamura's at Melbnova, and I knew that Melbourne didn't often get massively popular guests, so it was great to see firsthand and get an idea of how the event deals with massive amounts of people. While a lot of attendees would have just gone to get a signature, I'll be paying more attention to celebrity guests in the future. And that's all for Golden Over 2022. I don't really have anything to add other than it was about what I expected, and I wish I wasn't several years late for the love life craze. What are y'all into now? Is it Zombieland Saga? Project Sekai? I saw one cosplayer and one merch from those, respectively, and I'm struggling to get a read on the current anime idol climate of Australia.